uh, we'll be discussing about uh, the major uh, main provisions, uh, um, the major differences from FIDIC 99. Uh, and then uh, uh, I will try to, uh, you know, go through the close by close, the major differences, major clauses, and identify what are the, you know, uh, what are the new developments from FIDIC 2017. Yeah. Uh, and throughout this uh, uh, presentation, I'll be using FIDIC uh, 2017 as well as 99. That is solely for the education purposes. So uh, we hope that we are not uh, infringe any copyrights or any um, any other issues. So we just uh, use this material for the education purposes only. Right. Um, and if you have any questions, maybe you can record that. Uh, jot down and then you can ask that uh, at the end of the presentation because we would be, you know, uh, having a tight time frame. So I'll try to deliver everything uh, within two hours and then we will start uh, discussing the uh, questions and uh, questions basically. Yeah. So. Uh, yeah, so let me start with uh, the presentation. Uh, FIDIC 99 and FIDIC 2017, a discussion on the important updates. Yeah. Um, so first of all, uh, some facts about FIDIC. Uh, FIDIC. FIDIC started in 1913 uh, and then uh, the, uh, they published their first red book uh, in 1957 and then they published their first yellow book in 1963 that is for uh, mechanical and electrical works. Uh, then in 1987, uh, they published red and yellow books again. Yeah. Uh, and uh, so that was the development. In 1994, FIDIC established a task force to update the red, yellow uh, books. And as a result of that, in 1999, they published their rainbow edi edition, uh, which includes red book, yellow book, uh, silver book, and green book. Yeah. Uh, so now they call that as FIDIC 99 first edition. Uh, and then in uh, 2017, December, they published uh, red book and yellow book uh, and silver book also uh, and it's called second edition of FIDIC 99 basically yeah so it is the second edition of FIDIC 99 so they uh, publish these red yellow and silver books and apart from that they have many other uh, you know forms of contracts uh, which I'll not go through in detail uh, the advantages of FIDIC contracts are they are clear and coherent uh, fair and equitable uh, there is always a third party to, uh, you know, review, uh, to um, manage or administer the contract like an engineer. Uh, and it's they try to be complete and flexible and it is recognized throughout the world. So these are the advantages of using FIDIC contracts. Now, the FIDIC 2017, they clearly mentioned that the basis of the FIDIC 2017 is um, it continues the FIDIC's fundamental principles, which is to have a condition of contract which is fair and equitable between employer and the contractor. So they want to uh, bring that forward. Yeah, and they want to include, um, they want to enhance FIDIC 99 with the experience that they have got for 18 years from 99 to 2017. Uh, and they went uh, they try to make a greater detail and cl clarity on the requirements for notices and other communications. We will, we will get to know that what they have tried to do. do. Uh, and then uh, they wanted to have a level playing field for both the employee and the contractor. So if the employee wants to get something from the contractor now, he needs to raise a claim. Same as the contractor's claim, employee has to raise claims as well now. Yeah. And they have uh, separated claims and disputed disputes because there was a big uh, confusion in the industry. What is a claim? What is a dispute? Now they have clearly demarcated them. They have uh, given definitions. We will go to them. Uh, and uh, so they, they have distinguished what is a claim? What is a dispute? Uh, and then there's a mechanism for dispute avoidance. Yeah? They try to come to a common ground as quickly as possible using DAB dispute avoidance and adjudication board uh, so that disputes won't, uh, you know, uh, uh, go further. And then they wanted to have detailed provisions for quality management. 
and verification of contractors contractual compliance so they have introduced two clauses uh, two sub clauses for that so they wanted to make sure that contract is uh, contract is controlled in terms of quality yeah so these are the additions that they have done from fidic 99 and when we go through the clauses you will un understand uh, you know whether they are successful or not yeah so th those are the major principles of fidic 2017 from 99 now i'll come to these differences at the end of the presentation as well but in order to give an overall picture to you um, let's go through the major differences from 99 to 2017 the risk profile between the contract and the employer it's uh, it's same they have kept the 99 first edition risk profile um, uh, in to the in, to in 2017 as well so it's maintained clauses the clauses generally they try to um, elaborate more uh, and try to capture all the corners basically but doing so it is less flexible at the moment uh, more complex and less user friendly you will uh, you will get to know when we are going through the details uh, and it's exceptionally prescriptive drafting such as new definitions step by step procedure uh, project management hence long agreements but setting out exactly what is expected from each of the employee the contractor the engineer during the performance of the contract step by step it has been mentioned uh, and it result a great administrative burden on the contractor and in principle additional cost for the employer even for the engineer also i think now the engineer staff should be more uh, compared to fidic 19 and no any other forms of co uh, contract administration because a lot of things they need to do and new time limits which if not met trigger deeming provisions even for the engineer uh, for the contractor now they have given time limits so these time limits trigger deeming provisions we'll come to that uh, in detail uh, and then symmetry between the contractor and the employer's rights and obligation we'll come to some examples then we'll get to know that um, get get to understand about that uh, and then there's a provision to promote collaboration between the parties yeah so they wanted to go for collaboration now communication there's a, a big shift uh, they have broadened the concept of communication through notices now everything should be through notices capital n notices and when you issue these notices it should be clearly mentioned that it is a capital n uh, notices that means it's a defined notice yeah engineer role now it, it has been expanded yeah very prescriptive drafting the role the size has increased uh, previously 99 uh, edition had uh, 62 pages now it has increased to 106 pages so basically they have doubled the number of pages that means the um, it's very prescriptive now yeah this clearly underpins that the new edition is much more detailed rigid and perspective they have changed the terminology for example appendix to tender now uh, has been identified as contract data uh, force majeure has become exceptional events if you remember in fidic 99 i had this uh, problem always they had force majeure and the employees risk the same uh, type of risk have been uh, stipulated in both clauses now instead of both of them they have now uh, replaced that with exceptional events uh, and then dab dispute adjudication board in 99 has uh, become dispute avoidance and adjudication board so they have included a new sub clause to avoid disputes we will come to that um, and then there are a lot of new definitions and a broad interpretation rule interpretation clause so claims notices no objection notice of dissatisfaction disputes all are been defined and there is a broad interpretation clause now previously uh, uh, you know contract used to use shall may those kind of words but without any interpretation what it means now it has been interpreted so the you know it will reduce the risk of disagreements uh, over the interpretation of the contractual terms and the contractor's profit even if it ignited and if you remember 
uh, there were many uh, uh, clauses uh, where employers culpability is there the contractor was able to get extension of time cost uh, plus reasonable profit but when you try to claim this reasonable profit it's very difficult to establish a reasonable profit unless if it is um, it is mentioned in the boq day works under the provisional sums or anywhere else in the contract it is very difficult to um, you know uh, agree on the profit now uh, fitty 2017 says that whenever the contractor entitles the contractor for cost plus profit this profit is 5% unless otherwise stated so if the uh, if the parties have not unless stated otherwise 5% would be the reasonable profit so which is easy to uh, administer the contract now advance warning which is a new uh, sub clause again that means both parties contract and the employer should be vigilant and if they feel that any event will cause time or cost or quality issues in the project they need to give an advance warning so that uh, you know parties can take action and make sure that the project will not be impacted severely from that event yeah so that's a new term again work collaboratively program now a more detailed program requirements have been given uh, and then for the concurrent delays it has been uh, included concurrent delays also in pdic 2017 uh i request all of you to be uh, muted if you don't mind yeah right uh, and the program uh, also the clause says that uh, the software used for the program should be uh, as per the instruction of the engineer so to that level they have now gone deeming clauses and time bars throughout the fidic 2017 you will see you, you will see deeming clauses so many clauses now include deeming provisions upon a party's failure to act upon an obligation one important example is that the engineer is deemed to have given a notice of rejection of a claim if he does not give any agreement or rejection within 4 to 2 days after receiving a fully detailed claim now when you come to the claim uh, provision we will uh, uh, know this um, now as soon as there is a delay event happens as per the uh, clause 20 of fidic 2017 uh, contractor or the employer has to give a notice of claim this should be 28 days within the delay event and then both parties have 84 days to submit their detailed claim now 99 was having 42 days but now 84 days so if uh, you know after they submit the detailed statement or detailed claim engineer has now 42 days to give his uh, assessment if he fails to give so that means it's deemed the claim has been rejected so that is one example yeah we will come to many examples when we go through in detail variations now variation clause is very detailed uh, and um, if it, if engineer instruct something and if contractor feels that it's a claim or oh, it's a sorry it's a variation then he needs to uh, raise that to the uh, engineer without doing that uh, and if he does only he will get the money for the variation yeah so that's a new requirement basically claims we discussed just now uh, there are lot of changes happen uh, the claim uh, now has a single provision clause 20 very detailed provision uh, and uh, fully detailed claim um, the time margin for that has been increased from 42 to 84 days uh, and another thing now previously in 99 uh, if you don't give a notice to claim within 28 days from the delay event then uh, you will lose your right so notice was a condition precedent now in 2017 notice also a condition precedent same as 99 and if from the after the notice within 84 days if you fail to give the detailed claim again the contractor will lose his right or employer will lo lose his right so the submission of the detailed claim is uh, uh, submission of the detailed claim also condition precedent yeah 
so that's a new provision yeah we'll come to all of them in detail now yeah uh, right so these are the major differences you will find an extension of time another uh, um, uh, changes are there especially for uh, variations if if there are any delays caused by the variation uh, then uh, you can get extension of time and here it's clearly mentioned that 10% of the um, for any item BOQ item or any schedule item if the quantity has gone beyond uh, more than 10% than this stipulated in original contract and it has uh, you know affected the critical path or you know created a delay then you can get an extension of time without any notices so that is another new uh, addition disputes disputes they, they have identified what is a claim what is a dispute as well as um, there's a new focus on early dispute avoidance there's a sub clause for that we'll come to that so in general fidic 2017 appears to be materially amended the red book 99 and appears to be more rigid and requires proper contract administration from the onset of the project however the changes made appear to have addressed the main issues of the fidic 99 red book you will um, understand that when we go through one by one right so i'll first go to the contents and we will see what are the changes mainly uh, in 99 there were 20 uh, clauses now we have 21 clauses uh, 62 pages 106 pages so you can see the you know magnitude of the uh, content of the document has gone up and uh, dab general conditions have been changed to dab general conditions procedural rules are there for both index of sub clauses same uh, and then guidance for the preparation of particular conditions now has changed slightly so there's an introduction and then uh, the particular conditions part a is contract data instead of appendix to tender in 99 now it's called contract data yeah. then we come to the special provision how to write the particular conditions right and they have introduced five fidi golden principles their target is to not allow the you know drafters to change uh, drastically the fidi conditions they want to keep the risk balanced and uh, allow the drafters to change only the necessary clauses so that's why they these five golden principles are there yeah uh, others are same as per fidi 99 then you have the uh, you know um, uh, a new addition is there's an advisory note uh, if you implement uh, building information modeling to the project they have given an advisory note how to use fidic 2017 in a beam environment yeah so we'll go to that also and have a uh, look forms of security same as previously uh, then forms of letter of tender letter of acceptance contract agreement dispute ad uh, adjudication and avoidance agreement those are there so the major changes are uh, they have now contract data beam uh, you know uh, concept they have brought it brought in and then they have uh, introduction of the five golden uh, principles we'll come to that uh, in detail as well yeah right so the main clauses if you remember the clause one was general provisions the clause two was the employer the engineer was clause three in 99 contractor was clause four clause five nominated subcontractors clause six staff and labor Clause seven, plan, materials, and workmanship. Clause eight was commencement, delay, and uh, suspension, basically time. Clause nine was test on completion. Employees taking over, defects liability, measurement and evaluation, variation and adjustments, contract price and payment, termination by employer, termination by contractor, suspension and termination risk and responsibility insurance close 18 force major close 19 close 20 claims dispute and arbitration 67th page yeah now if you come to 2017 general provisions employer same engineer the contents have changed of course but the headings are same uh, instead of nominated subcontractors now it's called subcontracting so uh, previously the domestic subcontractors were within clause four 
of the, the contractors. Now they have brought the domestic contract subcontractors and nominated subcontractors into the subcontracting close five. Yeah, so that is a new change. Uh, commencement, those are same. Employers taking over defects. Uh, defects liability has been changed to defects after taking over. You will uh, notice throughout FIDIC 2017, they try to be uh, simple as possible in the wording. Yeah, so they have tried to clarify and, and make sure that there are no ambiguities when you read the clauses. So that's why you see defects after taking over. Instead of defects liability, they have uh, reworded. Re uh, instead of measurement and evaluation, now it's measurement and valuation. I mean, what do you mean by evaluation? Basically, isn't it? Valuation is giving more sense, actually. So uh, I agree with that term, actually. Uh, care of the works and indemnities. Now, instead of risk and responsibility, now they have uh, introduced this wording, care of the works and indemnities. Now they have identified contractors in indemnification, employees indemnification, and shared indemnification as well. There, yeah. yeah. So try to be collaborative and try to be balanced. Exceptional events. Instead of force major uh, and the employer's risks within clause 17, they have introduced exceptional events. Now the insurance clause is clause 19. Okay. Instead of clause 18, it's now clause 19. Uh, employers and contractors claims close 20 yeah instead of contractors claims and close 21 is disputes and arbitration 106th page yeah so th those are the major changes have happened uh, if you don't mind uh, please uh, switch off your you know um, video it should be uh, you know easy for everyone right if you go to the general provisions Close number one, the major changes are uh, the communication has now re revised to notices and other communications. Now I'm going through these headings first and then we'll come to the detail for 2017. We will compare 99 and 2017 in the same, um, you know, uh, same way. Right, limitation of liability. Previously it was, I think, in close four. They have now brought forward into close one. Contract termination, another new provision they have brought to close one. Uh, the employer, employers applied materials and employees equipment. They have brought, uh, I think it was in the clause four again. They brought into clause two now in 2017. The engineer's clause, uh, clause three has revised a lot. Uh, previously, clause 3.5 was determination, engineer's determination. Now they have changed it to agreement and determination. The provision is same in 99 also, even though it is determination, it had uh, two steps. One is agreement. The second one was determined by the engineer. Now they have a uh, word reworded as agreement and determination. And then they have introduced a new sub clause for meetings. Now engineer can call meetings uh, like management meetings between the contract and the employer or any other authority to, uh, you know, sort out the issues so basically another like dispute avoidance and some kind of a collaborative approach again yeah clause four has changed a lot um, so subcontractors have gone to um, you know the clause five now in 2017 so those are the main major changes employees free issue material has gone to clause two now employer if you remember subcontracting instead of nominated subcontractor now Nominated subcontractor and the domestic subcontractor are within the subcontracting clause. Uh, staff and labor uh, will come to that uh, very interesting. Uh, they have done some changes to the this, this clause. A uh, very important change they have done is key personnel. Now, usually in our contracts, um, in our projects, in this specification, we list out some key personnel like um, contractors. Um, construction manager, project manager, uh, chief quantity surveyor, uh, chief engineer, those kind of uh, positions, risk manager. We uh, have some uh, guidance, you know, the experience and the um, uh, qualifications that they should have. We have put it into the specification, but it has not been linked to the condition of contract basically before. Now, FIDIC 2017 uh, put a sub clause for key personnel and make sure that 
the contract is obliged to uh, deploy and or employ the key personnel that they, he has promised in this specification. So this is a new uh, provision again. Uh, plant material and workmanship. Uh, again, they have reword a little bit, but uh, the contents are almost same. In the time provision, close 80, sorry, close eight, they have introduced advance warning, which we discussed before. So the employee and the contractor should give advance warning if they feel th there's an event which will cause time or cost implication to the project. Uh, now, employee suspension, consequences of employee sub uh, suspension, payment for plant and material after employee suspension. You will notice this. If there's a suspension from employer, they always mention employer suspension. If the suspension is from the contractor, they mention contractor suspension. So it's very clear now. Yeah. In FIDIC 19 and also, there were two ways of doing suspension. Contractor can suspend himself or employer can or engineer can instruct suspension. Now, uh, it has been clearly identified in the clause name itself, so it is, which is clear. Taking off parts, uh, so these uh, provision, the headings are same, but if you come to the defects after taking over, they have uh, identified a little bit, uh, you know, they have reword the headings. Right, if you come to the measurement and valuation, um, instead of evolution, uh, evaluation basically, evaluation before, now it's called valuation of the work. Yeah. For the variation clause, uh, they have uh, done some changes materially in the content. We'll come to that later. Yeah. Uh, contractor price and payment. That is payment provision. Basically, um, there are no major changes in the headings. Uh, termination by employer. Termination for contractors default. Valuation after termination for contractors default. Payment after termination for contractors default. So, you know, from the name itself, they try to clarify it. Term termination for employees convenience, uh, valuation and payment after employees convenience. So these are new provisions again. Not new provisions, they have reworded it and make sure that it is very clear now. Uh, suspension and termination by contractor also, uh, they have reworded uh, the headings a little bit. Now, if you come to the indemnifications, uh, responsibility for the care of works clearly mentioned, uh, intellectual and industrial uh, property right, a new clause, indemnification by the uh, contractor. Uh, previously also indemnification was there for the contractor, especially in 99. Now they have uh, divided that to contractor, employee and the shared indemnities. So make sure it is very clear now. Yeah? And uh, it's fair now compared to FIDIC 99. Then when you come to the exceptional events, they have identified the exceptional events and then um, there's a due to minimize delay and the consequences of exceptional events, uh, optional termination, release from performance under the law. Yeah, so that is also clearly mentioned. Insurance, instead of clause 18, now it is 19. Uh, so it is now um, they have reworded it. Uh, and then you have uh, close to 20 uh, claims employee and the contractor yeah then you have a new clause dispute and arbitration yeah uh, so it discuss about the disputes and the dab and all how to do that yeah right so these are the major changes in the headings right without uh, taking further due let's go to the comparison between fidic 99 and uh, 2017 so in my left hand side this is fidic 99 and then you have FIDIC 2017 in my right hand side. Yeah, so we will try to compare uh, what are the major ch changes. Yeah, so I'll uh, uh, I have bookmarked uh, the major changes, the, the things that I'm going to discuss today. Uh, for example, typical sequence of principal events. I hope you can see my screen. Uh, if you don't see that, uh, if you uh, if it is hard to uh, read, please let me know. Yeah, in the chat. Right. If you remember the typical sequence of principal events in FIDIC 99 was uh, you have the tender documents and then you have um, um, uh, the submission of the tender. 28 days prior to that is the base date. Then you have the letter of acceptance uh, and then within 28 days from the LOA, you have to issue the performance security 
and then you can have a commencement date and this commencement date should have seven days prior notice. Uh, then you have the time for completion. Then uh, there can be delays because of the contractor. Then you have the test on completion and you issue the taking over certificate. Then you have the defects notification period. So you might have some uh, defects notified and that will be re remedied. And then you issue the uh, performance certificate uh, and then return the performance security within 21 days from the performance certificate. Now it is the same in FUDIC 2017. Nothing has changed. It's the same, uh, you know, sequence. Yeah. So I'll not go in detail actually. Basically, you see base, base date, uh, time for completion, test on completion, um, and the performance certificate, and the performance security should be issued within 21 days from the performance certificate. Yeah. So performance certificate means that is the last certificate uh, um, confirming that contractors obligations under the contract have been fulfilled. Yeah. So after the performance certificate has been issued, that means work has been done, taking over certificate issued, defects have been done, then you issue the performance certificate. So as soon as you issue the performance certificate, there's no need to keep the performance security because contract has fulfilled his obligations. So within 21 days, the employer can uh, you know, uh, issue the performance security back to the contractor. Yeah. So that is same, no changes. But when you come to the payments also, there's no changes. Previously, uh, contractor submits a statement. Engineer has 21, uh, eight days to issue the IPC, interim payment certificate. Employer has 56 days to pay from the statement. Yeah. Uh, and if it is the final payment, well, final payment has two stages, as you know, draft final statement. After the draft has been agreed by the engineer and contractor, contractor will submit the final statement. So from the final statement, there are, there's 28 days for the engineer to certify. And then 56 days for the employer to pay. It's the same, no changes. Uh, dispute. Um, um, uh, dispute events has a slight change. What is the change? Now from the commencement date, within 28 days, you had to appoint that dispute adjudication board as for FIDIC 99. And then as soon as there's a dispute, parties will refer that dispute to dispute adjudication board. So DAP has now 84 days to give their decision. After give the decision, if parties dissatisfied, they will issue notice of dissatisfaction within 28 days. From that notice of dissatisfaction, parties have uh, 56 days to amicably settle. After 56 days, you can go for the arbitration. Yeah, right. In the 2017, again, within 28 days from the letter of acceptance, you have to appoint the DAB, Dispute Avoidance and Adjudication Board. And if there's a dispute refers to the DAB, they have 84 days to give their decision. From that decision, within 28 days, parties should issue notice of dissatisfaction. Okay, capital N, capital D, N O D. It's a defined term. Then they have only uh, 28 days to do the amicable settlement. So they have saved 28 days from this uh, 56 days. So now it's 28 days. So they have tried to squeeze the dispute, um, you know, uh, events uh, or the total duration of the disputes. So that is the only difference there. Uh, when we come to the engineer's instruction in 99, sorry, um, yeah, okay. I hope Pico is not there now, right? In 99, there was no uh, engineer's instruction or the, sorry, engineer's uh, assessments. There were no time bars or time limits. So that was, uh, I think, one of the flaws in uh, FIDIC 99. Engineer can take uh, whatever the time he requires, but it should be reasonable. That was the term. So it's like a, a implied term, reasonable. What, what do you mean by reasonable time? So there was a problem. Now, FIDIC 2017 have introduced that engineer has 42 days or less to give any instruction or a, any, any assessment, basically, except payments. Uh, he has only 42 days. If either party comes with a uh, you know a request for a decision, he has 42 days. Yeah. So these 42 days calculates uh, from different point of uh, time. Yeah. So 
say for instance i'm the employer and there is a contractor and if i decide dissatisfied with something i will issue a um, uh, notice to the engineer to assess that so the 42 days starts from that yeah so likewise uh, whatever the uh, time limitation uh, has mentioned in the um, uh, clauses the time would start ticking for the engineer from that day onwards yeah whenever you ask for something from that day the time will start ticking for the uh, engineer so engineer has 42 days now his to give his consultation right now the scenario there can be three scenarios the first scenario is everything is good engineer has been asked to do a consultation so he has done that within 42 days then parties uh, as soon as parties agree with that the engineer's decision uh, they will issue notice of parties agreement that is also n capital p capital a capital defined term notice of parties agreement so that will be issued by the engineer to the parties so it, the matter is closed however if one party identifies that there is a error in the engineer's determination or the engineer's agreement uh then they can raise that within 14 days uh then uh engineer has to rectify that within 7 days that is an error yeah po error so that is a scenario 1 scenario 2 is now parties don't agree okay so engineer first try to consult both parties and give his uh, judgment decision parties don't agree yeah so what will happen is parties will advise to the engineer that they don't agree with the engineer's decision then engineer has another 42 days to give his determination because in the first instance he try to consult both parties and try to come to an agreement parties don't agree so as soon as parties uh, issue their notice of dissatisfaction another nod from that day engineer has another 42 days to issue his determination yeah and this determination should be fair parties might not agree but he will try to give a fair uh, assessment based on his experience and knowledge right so engineer has now given his determination then uh, uh, notice of error if there is error again parties have 14 days to issue their no, uh, error say for instance in this situation there is no error uh, from the determination also parties have 28 days to issue notice of dissatisfaction if they fail to do so say for instance uh, uh, engineer try to consult within 4 to 2 days parties disagree engineer issued not uh, determination after 4 to 2 days again if parties don't issue a notice of dissatisfaction within 28 days that considered as the parties have agreed to the determination yeah so that's another deeming provision yeah so and it's final and binding so if parties disagree they have to raise their uh, notice of dissatisfaction within 28 days so that is a uh, scenario number 2 scenario number 3 is again the parties don't agree so try, engineer try to consult no engineer issued the determination 42 days now they found that there is an error okay in the determination so parties have 14 days to raise that engineer has 7 days to correct it and then again from that point they have 28 days to issue the notice of dissatisfaction yeah so i think you might uh, it is clear to you now so these are the three scenarios now i managed to i think uh, explain you the clause three basically the engineer's determination uh, from this uh, sequence of uh, you know events that's why i went through that in detail so that uh, you know it's easy for us to understand clause three right now we come to the clause one definitions so i'll take fidic 99 also into my left hand side now in fidic 99 if you remember the general provisions or the definitions were uh, classified under the contract uh, parties and persons dates likewise now in 2017 it is in line with the alphabetical order they have not categorized them or grouped them together yeah so it's in alphabetical order and as i remember there were there are around 109 we will come to that 109 definitions so they have tried to define everything basically yeah advance payment certificate a new term uh, define 
uh, advance payment guarantee defined claim they have given a definition claim means a request or assertion by one party to the other party for an entitlement or relief under any clause of these conditions or otherwise that means or under law in connection with or arising out of the contract for the execution of the works so that is called claim yeah so now you understand what is a variation what is a claim claim is defined clearly uh, they have introduced a new system called compliance verification system that means uh, the uh, a kind of a complaint compliance verification system kind of that he will be complying with the contractual and uh, contractual requirement yeah. so it will be about the workmanship quality uh, everything it should be covered in the compliance verification system and it should be submitted uh, in the begin is uh, agreement and after that contract has to comply with that uh, compliance verification system and he, i think as i remember he has to issue reports every month on the compliance verification system and showing that he is doing everything in line with the contract condition of contract a new uh, you know defined defined define term contract within the contract they mention that any addenda refer to the con contract agreement so addendums or contract addenda also have been uh, you know incorporated into the contract definition which is very good yeah uh, jv they have allowed joint venture undertakings also joint venture companies also can use fidi cruzan 17 now yeah uh, contract data you remember appendix to tender the 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 two page or two or maximum three page document that includes uh, most of the uh, important information of a contract like retention amount retention um, advance payment amount um, insurances all those kind of things now called contract data yeah so that's a new term uh cost plus profit now we'll come to the cost as well now if you come here in 99 cost was defined uh right cost means all ex expenditure reasonable incurred uh but does not include profit now here they went on to say that where the contract is entitled under sub clause of these conditions to payment of cost it shall be added to the contract price so now they have clarified it a little bit more cost plus profit here it says that means cost plus the applicable percentage of profit stated in the contract data so you have to mention that in the contract data if not stated 5% such percentage shall be added to cost yeah so if not stated 5% is the no yeah so that is another way of uh, i would say fidic 2017 is like a uh, automation of the contract basically so this is another uh, you know one significant thing in doing so yeah so the contract itself will run you know if parties uh, fails to you know do their obligations timely contract will run and it, it will deem that they have done that work so that is how it works yeah dab dispute uh, evidence and adjudication which we discussed just now they have introduced a new thing called date of completion now time for completion was the defined term in 99 or 87 or anywhere time for completion that means how many days that has been mentioned in the contract data to complete the project time for completion now they have thing called date of completion that means usually the contractors will usually they might have uh, they might have some delays so they will finish on certain day so for that day it's called date of completion the date that mentioned in the taking over certificate as the Uh, project completion date is called date of completion so they have given a uh, defined term so that it is easy for our contract administration uh, later yeah so that you have a term defined term to uh, you know identify that right uh delay damages again defined it's not a big deal disputes have been defined now disputes means any situation where one party makes a claim against the other party okay the other party rejects the claim they don't agree with that claim and the first party also now does not agree with that rejection then there is a dispute okay so dispute has been defined right 
uh, employee supplied material defined, exceptional events defined, extension of time again defined, general conditions, joint venture defined, uh, joint venture un uh, undertaking. It's very important. We'll come to that quickly. So that uh, joint venture undertaking means the letter provided by the employer as part of the tender setting out the legal undertaking between the two or more persons constituting the contract as a JV. This letter shall be signed by all the per persons who are members of the JV, shall be addressed to the employer and shall include each such member's undertaking to be jointly and severally liable to the employer for the performance of the contractor's obligation under the contract. Identification and authorization of the leader of the GP, JV and identification of the separate scope or part of the works carried out by each member of the JV. This is very important because I have uh, encountered, um, uh, I've seen actually um, uh, in RICS case study one time, uh, you know, the JV, there was a contractor JV and one party has run away. So the other party is doing the work. Now it's a big uh, dispute, the big mess basically. So when you have the JV undertaking, you can make accountable all the parties of that JV. Yeah, so that is a new provision. So they're thinking about the collaborative working in the modern age and they try to incorporate that into the conditions. Yeah. Key personnel means the positions of the contractor's personnel other than the contractor's representative that I stated in this specification. It's a new term. Now laws. Previously, laws were uh, only uh, mentioned about the country. Laws in the country. Now they say international law and other laws which can be contentious uh, later when you try to use FIDIC 2017 because um, you know the particular country might not like to use international law provisions uh, so that can that to be tested yeah month is a calendar month no objection what do you mean by no objection it's clearly mentioned here means the engineer has no objection to the contractor's document or other documents submitted by the contractor under these conditions okay notice means a written communication Notice of dissatisfaction, NOD. Yeah, so NOD can be issued for engineers' uh, determination or engineers' uh, decision. If parties don't agree, you issue notice of dissatisfaction. Or you uh, for the DAPS decision, DAPS given a decision, people don't uh, agree. Within 28 days, you issue notice of dissatisfaction. Again, a defined term now. Particular conditions defined for the parties. Now, previously, party was defined. Now parties have been defined. Parties means both the employee and the contractor. Yeah, those are new terms. So uh, program, QM system. Uh, this is a new quality management system. Again, the contractor should provide this quality management system, and uh, you know show to the engineer how he's going to control the quality of the project. Yeah, the workmanship, the materials, all the quality. So that should be again uh, consented by the engineer. And then according to that, the contractor should follow the process. What do you mean by review? Means examination and consideration by the engineer. Again, defined. Okay. Uh, schedule of payments defined, special provision defined. So I'll not go uh, through everything basically because we don't have uh, too much time on that. Um, and unforeseeable. Now you will see throughout FIDIC 2017, they have taken the baseline date as the for, for any any event or for anything that you want to uh, identify the change from the baseline they have identified base date as the baseline now if you go to the fitting 99 sometimes they refer to base date sometimes they refer to tender date so it's all over the place now fitting 2017 try to uh, you know uh, pinpoint it to the base date so that it's very clear base date is 28 days prior to the tender uh, close closing date yeah. year has been defined 365 days so uh, as i remember there's around 88 here before i think it's around 50 59 now it's 89 as i remember so 30 new uh, you know uh, definitions have gone have, have been introduced right i'll come to the interpretation as well now interpretation they have expanded the interpretation clause of feeding 99 now may, what do you mean by may? Means that the party or persons referred to has the choice or with choice of whether to act or not. Yeah, so if, if, if it says engineer may do that, that means he, engineer can do it or he, he, he can opt to not to do it as well. So that's what may means, yeah, it's defined. 
shall. Now, if you remember, previously we implied that shall means it's an obligation. Now it's clearly mentioned in the defined interpretation clause. Shall means the party or persons referred to as an obligation under the contract to perform the duty referred to it. Consent. What do you mean by consent? Giving the permission. Including. Include. That means it is part of that. Yeah. Words indicating. Uh, uh, words indicating persons or parties shall be interpreted as referring to natural and legal persons. OK, execute the works, execution of the works. What do you mean by that? Means the construction and completion of the works and the remedying of any defects. Yeah, so it's very clear now. Yeah, so interpretation clause also have been expanded. Yeah, so I think it's clear to you. I'll come to the notices and uh, communications. Right, very important. If we come to the communication in the see, see, this is the interpretation clause in FIDIC 99. Now it has been expanded a lot. Yeah. So previously it was not mentioned about what is shall, uh, may, all these kind of things. Communication clause. Now it says that uh, the communication should be uh, done through notices. You have to give notice. If you want to communicate to the engineer, give a notice. Employer, give a notice. So everything is through notice, notices basically. And you will find this notice like, uh, you know, 200, 300 times throughout the period 2017. Everything should be through notices. And there's no verbal instructions now. In 99, engineer can issue verbal instructions and contractor can issue confirmation of verbal instructions. Now nothing is there. Everything should be in writing. Yeah, through notices. And if you are not issuing a notice, it shall be identified as a notice should be clearly mentioned capital N notice I'm going to issue to you now. Yeah. Right. So notice should be issued to the uh, address. Uh, now, if you issue to the engineer notice to the engineer as a contractor, then engineers address would be mentioned in the contract data. So you have to issue to that. Right. But if you issue electronically. People used to do that now emails and all if, if they do that. An electronically transmitted notice, so other communication is deemed to have been received on the day after the termination, after transmission, being on the day after transmission. Yeah, so being received on the day after transmission. Yeah, so we would consider that it has been issued on the same day. Yeah, after the termination, after the transmission has been done, unless there's a non-delivery notification comes, you will consider that the you know transmission has done on the same day <clears throat> so that is a new term new addition from 99 now when you come to the priority of documents priority of documents uh, they have uh, now you have the contract agreement it's same letter of acceptance letter of tender now particular conditions have been divided into two contract data and the special provisions so contract data is the appendix to tender before now it's called contract data so it has a higher priority than the special provisions now. Yeah. Uh, then the G by general conditions, specifications, drawings, schedules, and JV undertaking also have been introduced. <clears throat> if a party finds an ambiguity or discrepancy in the documents, the contract documents, that party shall promptly give a notice to the engineer. Again, communication. You give the notice to the engineer saying that there's an ambiguity, discrepancy, and request him. To give his advice okay, or clarification. Right now, assignment. This is uh, one good example to uh, show um, you know uh, what they have tried to do. Now, in 99, uh, um, uh, neither party shall assign the whole or any part of the contract or any benefit or interest in or under the contract. So, neither party can assign. However, Either party may assign the whole or any part of the prior agreement of the other party. So if you agree with the other party, you can do that at the sole discretion of such other party. So if contractor wants to assign something, he has to get an approval from the employer. You can do that. That is A. When it comes to B, may as security in favor of a bank or financial institution, assign its right to any monies due or to become due under the contract. Now it says that if a party uh, has any uh, you know monies due to a bank, you can 
uh, assigned to that bank. And we have seen that contractors have done that. They assign this uh, uh, contract to a bank, so bank can receive the money, receive the payments. But it doesn't clearly say that. Do you need the uh, approval from the other party? And uh, it seems A and B is contradicting also. Now it here says that the same clause they added the B without the prior agreement of the other party. So now for the second one, if you want to assign your rights of the contract to a bank, you don't have to ask from the other party. So they have now clarified it. Yeah. So uh, you know it's it's more clear now. Yeah. So I hope you all understand that throughout FIDIC 2017, you will find a lot of um, you know issues in FIDIC 99 have been addressed like that. Uh, right, we discuss about the priority of documents, assignment, uh, compliance with laws. Right, compliance with laws. Uh, right, when you compliance with laws, this is a new addition basically. Uh, now, contractor uh, shall give all notices, pay all taxes, permits, permissions uh, for the execution of the works. Usually, when uh, permits are required for the execution of the works, contractor should take it. But when permits are required for the design of the works, employee should take it. So when contract is taking any permits, employees sh should support the contractor. When employee is taking any permit, contractor support all. It means supporting. Uh, uh, I hope everything is fine. I hope now you can hear me. Yeah, everything is fine, hopefully. Right. So if either party suffers, is it okay now? Right, okay. Sorry, I think there were some uh, issues in the network. Now, if either party suffers delays, then they can get extension of time. The contractor can get EOT and he can get cost plus profit. The employer also can get uh, additional cost if he suffers because of, you know, try to support the contractor. So that's what that uh, clause says. Yeah, I'll not go in detail on that, but you can have a, um, you know, you can uh, go through that. That is essentially what it says. Yeah. Uh, right, limitation of liability. Now, in 2017, FIDIC 2017, it clearly says that in number of clauses that you can claim loss of profit, like in an omission, you know, if, if engineer instructs an omission, contractor can uh, get loss of profit because of that omission. Um, if uh, employer terminate the contractor for convenience or uh, contractor terminate the employer because of the employee's default. In those situations, contractor can get the loss of profit. It's clearly mentioned. So in the limitation of liability clause now, they have mentioned that unless those situations, unless these clauses, contractor can not take any loss of profit or consequential damages. But for those situations, he can get that. That's what it says, Yeah, the limitation of liability. So these are the situations loss of profit can be claimed. So which is very detailed now, very uh, clear, clear cut. Right, employer's personnel. Now, if you go to the employer's personnel before 2.3, you will see that, you know, they try to be uh, more balanced, risk balanced approach now. Yeah, before employer's personnel, the employer shall be responsible for ensuring that the employer's personnel and the employer's other contractors on the site cooperate with the contractors. Take action similar to those with the contractor is required to take under subparagraph uh, safety, protection of the environment. So what it says is employees personnel should cooperate with the contractor and they should be, you know, following the safety procedures and then protection and environmental regulations. That's it in 99. But in 2017, it says that the now contractor can require the employee to remove uh, any person of the employee's personnel, he can request to remove people from the employee's personnel. So you see that now contractor also having a 
uh, upper hand uh, who is found based on reasonable evidence to have engaged in corrupt fraudulent collusive co collusive or co uh, coercive practices yeah so in that situations contractor can ask employer to remove people from the employer staff so now it seems little bit balanced yeah now employer's financial arrangements a very uh, what is that called um, they have changed drastically from 99 now 99 employer's financial arrangement means employee shall submit within 28 days after receiving any request from the contractor reasonable evidence that financial ar uh, arrangements have been made and been maintained so if contractor ask uh, to show the financial arrangements employee should show that arrangement within 28 days that's what mentioned in 99 basically in uh, 2017 it says that employee's arrangements of financing the employee's obligations under the contract shall be detailed in the contract data so in the contract itself it should be mentioned now contractor doesn't have to ask for that it should be there in the contract data uh, can, uh, employee can say that you know it's in a bank or it's in a bank loan he has to show that in the contract itself yeah. and then if there any material changes happens in these situations receive an instruction to execute a variation with price price greater than 10% of the accepted contract amount contractor receives a variation more than 10% of the accepted contract amount or does not receive a payment or uh, he becomes aware that employee's financial arrangements are not uh, not there i mean there, some issues are there material change has happened in these three situations contractor again can ask uh you know reasonable evidence then employee has to give that within 28 days so the clause is now broader and very detailed yeah i'm not sure whether this will uh, survive uh, in the markets but it is there uh site data and items of reference a new provision again uh, the employee shall made available the contractor for information before the base date all relevant data in the employee's possession on the topography of the site and on the subsurface so every information should be given to the contractor now okay uh, whatever the things employer got before the base date that means if contractor can prove that employee knew something before the base date and it was not disclosed to the contractor then contractor can uh, you know take um, take actions against employee now because it's clearly mentioned now employee has to disclose everything before the base uh, anything that he knew before the base day employee supplied materials and employee's equipment if employer uh, can we uh, can you switch off uh, your uh, your um, um, sorry um, your videos please if you don't mind yeah if employee supplied materials and no employee's equipments are listed in the specification for the contractor's use in the execution of the works the employee shall make such materials and no equipment available to the contractor in accordance with the details times arrangements rates and prices stated in the specification the can so if it's mentioned in the contract that employee is going to give some materials or equipments or no he should give them within the time period mentioned the contract shall be responsible for each item of employee's equipment while any of the contractor's personnel is operating after you give to the contractor contract is responsible for that but before that employee should make sure that it is given timely and appropriately yeah so that is a new provision again right we'll come to the engineer's instruction now right engineer's instruction so engineer can issue instructions at any time yeah uh if an instruction state that it constitutes uh, can you switch off uh, uh, your videos if you don't mind yeah uh, if an instruction state that it constitutes a variation then it goes to this variation clause however if it's not mentioned as a variation and engineer has issued the instruction and contractor considers it's a variation then he should contractor shall immediately and before commencing any works related to the instruction give a notice to the engineer with reasons he has to give with reasons now that is a now new addition in 2017 everywhere say for instance if employer is reviewing a payment of a contractor 
he cannot cut and chop as he wants. If he does any changes to the statement of the contractor or the payment application of the contractor, he has to give reasons for that. He has done that. So it is the common uh, you know, uh, way of doing things in 2017. Any party wants to give, uh, you know, uh, wants to say something, they have to give reasons for that. Yeah. So notice uh, to the engineer with reasons. If the engineer does not respond within seven days now, yeah. Now engineer issued an instruction. Contractor considers that it's a variation. He should notice saying that it is a variation and he should he show why it is a variation. And engineer has seven days to respond. If he has not responded by giving a notice of confirming, confirming, reversing or varying the instruction, the engineer shall be deemed to have revoked the instruction. Okay. So engineer has only seven days. If he has not given that uh, you know confirmation, then it's deemed to be revoked. Yeah. Otherwise, the contractor shall comply with and be bound in the terms of the engineer's response. Okay, that's clear. Right now, engineer's agreement or determination, which we discuss in detail uh, during that sequence of events. Yeah. So we'll come to that now. When carrying out his or duties under the sub clause, the engineer shall act neutrally. Neutrally between the parties and shall not be deemed to act for the employer. It's a new provision now. It says it should be impartial, neutral. Yeah, not impartial, neutral. That's a word. Whenever these conditions provide that the engineer shall proceed under the sub clause to agree or determine any matter or claim, the following procedure shall apply. Right. The first thing is he tried to consult both parties to reach an agreement. OK, so that is the first step. OK, and in doing so, there has a time limit. Time limit is 42 days usually. Yeah. Right. But if either parties disagrees and don't want to, uh, you know, uh, support the engineer, then engineer has from that notice of uh, dissatisfaction or the uh, from that day, he has 42 days to determine. Yeah. So engineer now determine. So that is the time limit. The engineer shall give notice of agreement if agreement is achieved within 42 days. Now, one important thing is if parties agree after the engineer has done a consultation, then they will issue an agreement. Okay. Engineer shall give a notice of both parties of the agreement, which agreement shall be signed by both parties. You now, both parties sign that agreement. And that notice shall state that it is a notice of the parties' agreement. Notice of the parties' agreement. It's a defined term now. Yeah. But if the engineer issue a determination parties don't agree it is called notice of the engineer's determination time limit is 42 days usually yeah um, so i'll not come to that they have explained how to calculate the uh, starting time for 42 days yeah so i'll not go through in detail uh, so we, we can discuss uh, yeah in the, in the case of a matter to be agreed or determined, the date of commencement of the time limit for agreement as stated in the applicable sub clause. Okay. So if a sub clause says that party should, should you know, or the engineer should agree or determine, that, that sub clause, the, 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 uh, play, uh, uh, the time point start from that uh, starts counting for two days. In the, case, in the case of claim, engineer receives a notice. Okay. 42 days starts and if it is a detailed claim have been given after 40 uh, within 84 days from the notice then 42 days starts from that detailed claim so that's what it, it says yeah uh, right now very important provision the engineer shall give the notice of his so determination within 42 days so within such other time limit as may be proposed by the engineer or agreed by the parties after the date corresponding his obligation under the world. Okay, he, he has 42 days to give this decision. If the engineer does not give the notice of agreement, okay, what will happen? Or determination within the relevant time limit. Now, 42 days elapsed, engineer has not given anything. Now, if it is a claim, the engineer shall be deemed to have given uh, a determination rejecting the claim. So, if it is a claim, if engineer has not given anything within uh, 42 days, that means claim has been rejected. But if anything else that, uh, you know, like a payment or any other thing that engineer should have determined 
an engineer has not done within four to two days, it will be considered as a dispute. That's a new provision. Then it will go to the dispute uh, adjudicate, avoidance and adjudication process. So now if engineer is silent, it will uh, automatically go to the disputes other than a claim. So that's a new provision. Yeah. Uh, right. Now effect of the agreement or determination. So engineer can issue agreement or determination. What is the effect? Each agreement or determination shall be binding on both parties unless and until corrected under the surplus or from the DAB or dispute, adjudic dispute and avoidance clause. If an agreement or determination concerns the payment of an amount for one party to the other party, the contractor shall include such amount in the next statement. So if engineer has given an agreement or determination and it has a financial implication or payment, Contractor can ask that payment next payment in itself. That's what it, that's what it says. If within 14 days after giving or receiving the engineer's notice of agreement or determination, any error, type, typographical or clerical or arithmetical uh, nature found, parties should give their uh, should raise that. I think you remember that within 14 days from the engineer's agreement or determination, parties have 14 days to raise any errors. Then engineer shall issue. Uh, revised one within seven days okay yeah so th that's what it says now if you dissatisfied with engineers de determination then what you will do you have only 28 days from the engineers notice of the determination to raise a notice of dissatisfaction yeah uh, right if no nod is given now, after you give the notice of dissatisfaction, then it will go to the DAB. Okay, so uh, the parties can go to the DAB and get a decision from the DAB. Now, if no NOD is given by either party within the period of 28 days, uh, what will happen? Engineer shall be deemed, the, the, sorry, the determination of the engineer shall be deemed to have been accepted by both parties and shall be final and binding on them. So, engineer has given a determination, parties don't do anything for 28 days, then it will become final and binding. So that's another, you know, automation. 2017 is automated now. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Right. So if there's a part of the determination that parties don't agree, then you uh, the parties can raise a uh, notice of dissatisfaction for the part for that part only. So the balance part which parties have not uh, raised any NOD within 84 days become final. That's what it, the next uh, para says. Right, so I'll go to the, then the meetings, another new provision. The engineer or the contractor's representative may require the other to attend a management meeting to discuss arrangements for future work and no other matters in connection with the execution of the works. Yeah. So if, we, if they have any future issues or issues at the moment, they can ask for a management meeting. The employees, other contractors, the personnel of legal, constituted public authorities, utility companies, anyone can attend. Okay. The engineer shall keep a record of each management meeting and supply copies of the record. Okay, that's that's what it says. Right. So uh, it, it is kind of another new provision given for both parties to re resolve disputes or resolve issues. Basically, you can uh, call for management meetings and. Either engineer or the contractor representative can call for that. Yeah, right. We come to the clause 4.2. Now, uh, it is an obligation uh, of the contractor to provide a performance security. Okay, within 28 days from the letter of acceptance. If contractor fails to do so, employee can terminate the contractor under the contractor's default. Okay. Now, say for instance, uh, performance certificate has been given. Sorry, performance security has been given. Now, there was a uh, big discussion in the industry because in, in our normal contracts, we have variations. Usually variations uh, go beyond 10%, sometimes 20%. So now there's a discussion, how, what you do for the performance security? Yeah, so performance security is the document that will make sure that contractor will perform. Now, if you don't have, uh, you know, if you have a big variation and if you don't amend the performance sec uh, security, then you don't have that, uh, you know, you know, the uh, what is that called? Uh, uh, coverage is not there. Now, it says here, whenever variation, so adjustment under the clause 30, 
increase or decrease the contract price by more than 20% of the accepted contract amount, you can ask for a revised performance security. In the case of such increase, the employees request the contractor shall promptly increase the amount of performance security. Okay. If there's a decrease also, subject to employer's prior consent, the contractor may decrease the amount of performance security in the currency by a percentage equal to the accumulated, uh, accumulative decrease. So even decrease can be done for the performance security. Uh, then uh, the claims under the performance security is same. Only one additional is there. That is if there any defective uh, equipment, uh, or the plant installed in the project and contract has removed it and he fails to bring it back, then um, again performance security can be encashed. Right. And then uh, any amount you have encashed from the performance security should be considered in the final payment. Uh, that's what the next part says. Yeah. So I'll not go in detail on that. Mm, yeah. So release of the performance security also performance certificate also have been uh, mentioned okay within 21 days after the issue of the performance certificate now it's it's very important it's slightly different from 99 okay let me come to the performance uh, certificate i missed that performance certificate one minute um, cooperation Contract as representative performance security. Now, performance security, it says that uh, the employee shall return the performance security to the contractor within 21 days after receiving a copy of the performance certificate. That's what 99 says. So, employer should receive a copy of the performance certificate and then he can uh, release the performance security within 21 days. Here is change within 21 days after the issue of the performance certificate. So, you know, employer doesn't need to receive a copy. It's not linked to that. As soon as the uh, performance certificate is issued, within 21 days, contract should get the performance security back. Yeah. Even in a termination situation, uh, after everything has been finalized, he should be able to get the performance security. Yeah. Right. With that, we come to the uh, contractor's documents. Right, so contractor's documents includes uh, anything that mentioned in the specification. The, so these are new additions basically. Yeah, the, These blue color ones, I compared against the FIDIC 99 and identified as the new additions. Yeah, uh, Required to satisfy all permits, permissions, any documents that he produced called contractor's documents. Um, as build records, operation and maintenance ma manuals uh, or any other a contractor's general obligations when he produce any document those are called contractors documents and then contractor should submit these to the engineer for his consent the engineer shall of uh, within 21 days after receiving the contractor's documents and this notice from the contractor give a notice to the contractor of no objection or that the contractor's document fails uh, to comply with the contract with reasons. Now he has to give reasons also again. Okay? Yeah. If the engineer fails to give any notice within 21 days, the engineer shall be deemed to have given a notice of no objection. So in, if engineer is silent, automatically that will be approved contractor's document. So again, another deeming provision. Yeah. Time limit is there, deeming provision is there. Uh, after receiving a notice under the, the contractor shall re revise Okay, he will again revise after engineer says that there's there are some issues. So that's what it says. Yeah, a new terminology or new subclause have been introduced called training. Now, sometimes in some projects, you might have to train the employees people, em employers uh, staff. So now in 2017, training has become mandatory to uh, hand over project to a uh, employer. Yeah. So when you hand over to a project to a project to an employer, you have to satisfy the test on completion. Project should be substantially completed. That means it should be able to use, uh, put it into the intended use. And then uh, operation and maintenance manuals should be submitted. Uh, as bill drawings should be submitted. And then you have to give the training as well for the employer staff. That is another requirement in order to take, hand over a project. Yeah, taking over. 
So training. Uh, contractor shall carry out training of the employees employees in the operation and maintenance of the works. Yeah, so that's a new term, new, new, uh, new. What is that called? Provision. OK, right. So that is that and the cooperation again. Uh, contractor shall cooperate with the employer and the employers other contractors. However, when he does that, if he suffers any delay, or um, cost, he will get EOT as well as cost plus reasonable profit. Yeah, so that's uh, a new addition in the cooperation. Uh, yeah, I'll go to the QM system now. Quality management and uh, compliance verification. So this is a new provision again, FIDIC 2017. Uh, quality management system. The contractor shall prepare and implement a quality management system to demonstrate compliance with the requirement of the contract of the contract. OK, so he has should uh, prepare a system quality management system. The QM system shall be specifically prepared for the works and submitted to the engineer within 28 days from the commencement date. Yeah. Thereafter, whenever the QM system is updated or revised, the copy shall promptly submitted to the engineer. OK, and it should include. Contractors documents as built up uh, uh, information. Uh, how he is going to coordinate and management uh, of the interfaces, uh, all kind of things will be mentioned. Uh, so, uh, yeah. So, engineer may review the quality management system and may give a notice of uh, to the contractor, state in the extent to which it does not comply with the contract. Okay, he can give that. Within 14 days after receiving this notice, the contractor shall revise the QM system to rectify such non-compliance. If the engineer does not give such notice within 21 days, contractor submits the QM system. Engineer is silent for 21 days. Uh, the engineer shall be deemed to have given a notice of no objection. Again, now engineer should be vigilant. OK. Mm, so that is that is that uh, basically uh, about the QM system and this QM system quality management system should be updated every six months. OK. Uh, to make sure that you know contract is doing his material workmanship and the work uh, within the quality parameters of the specification of the project. Yeah, compliance verification system. Another system should be uh, developed by the contractor that is for the contract compliance system. OK, the contractor shall prepare and implement a compliance verification system to demonstrate that the design materials, employed supplied materials, plant work and workmanship comply in all respects with the contract. The compliance verification shall be in accordance with the details stated in specification and shall include a method for reporting the results of all inspections and tests carried out by the contractor. In the event that the inspection of or test identifies a non-compliance with the contract, then defects and rejection clause will apply. OK, so another thing, compliance verification system. I'll not go in detail on that. Yeah. So these are new additions in 2017. Right, access route. Now, previously, uh, in the 4.15, I think 4.15 access route. Yeah, it was mentioned that contract should be given the access routes, uh, and the contract is uh, responsible to you know maintain it. That's what mentioned in the 99. In 2017, says that to the extent that non available to non available of an access route arises as a result of changes to that access route by the employer. So if the employee changes the access route now. And contractor suffers a delay and incur any cost, he can get EOT and cost. OK, so this is a new provision which was not in the 99. Yeah, so that is a difference. Progress report. Now progress reports, it's more or less same. Yeah, compared to uh, FIDIC uh, 99. However, uh, Previously, there was a uh, you know agreement in the industry that um, if you say something in the progress report, it can be construed as a notice. Now here clearly says that in FIDIC 2017. However, nothing stated in any progress report shall constitute a notice under subclause of these conditions. Yeah. So uh, progress report, anything mentioned in the progress report doesn't become notices. Okay. Right. Subcontracting. Close five. Uh, right. So what will happen is subcontractors. OK. Uh, 
any subcontractors that uh, contract is going to deploy in the project, he should give uh, the details of the subcontracting. And an engineer has 14 days to approve or, or object. However, engineer uh, don't give that uh, consent or his objection within 14 days. It's deemed to have been given the consent. So again, automated. Okay, so contractor should be vigilant now. Okay, nominated subcontractors. Now, a very important thing. If you go to FIDIC 99, objection to nomination. This is the clause. So if contractor believes that you know the subcontractor is not um, you know capable, he's not uh, willing to indemnify the contractor uh, and uh, willing to undertake the contractor's obligations under the contract, then he can object. But there was no time limit for that. Yeah, so that was a loophole. Now they have introduced. He has 14 days to give the uh, you know um, uh, objection to no, uh, objection to nomination from the engineer's instru instruction. If he fails to do so, it constitutes that contractor agrees for that subcontractor. So again, time limit has been introduced. Yeah. Uh, so it's uh, other than that, it's not that different. Um, right now, a very important thing. Now, evidence of payment. If you go to 99 again, it says that um, engineer can ask from the contractor for the evidence of payment for the nominator subcontractors. So, if contractor fails to give any evidence of payment uh, to the nominator subcontractors, then uh, employer can directly pay to the nominator subcontractor uh, and then deduct it. It says that the employer may pay direct to the nominated subcontractor part to all previously certified as are due to the nominated subcontractor and for which the contract has failed to submit, the contractor shall then repay to the employer. Now, how to repay to the employer? It's not clear. Usually, engineer will deduct that from the payment certificate of the main contractor. That's what usually happens. Now, it's clearly mentioned here in 2030. The same thing happened. Evidence of payment has not been given. Thereafter, the engineer shall give a notice to the contractor stating the amount paid directly to the nominator subcontractor by the employer. And in the next IPC, after this notice, shall include this amount as a deduction under sub, uh, paragraph B. So it's very clear now. Yeah, you will deduct it. Yeah, right. Mm. Recruitment of persons, very important thing. Uh, now, if you go to the uh, recruitment of persons, uh, Right here, close sub clause 6.3 in 99. The contractor shall not recruit or attempt to recruit staff and labor from amongst the employer's personnel. Now, the previous provision was contractor cannot recruit the employer's people. That's all. Now, here it says that it is still there, but neither the employer nor the engineer shall recruit or attempt to recruit staff and labor from amongst the contractor's personnel. So now any party cannot recruit from the other parties. So now it's balanced. Yeah. So I, I want to sh show you that they try to address the issues in FIDIC 99. Yeah. And try to be more balanced approach. Yeah. Uh, so everywhere it is notices. Okay. Uh, contractors personnel. The employees personnel. Uh, contractors records. Right. Um, Right, Con contractor's records. If you go to the contractor's records, actually, uh, contractor's records, uh, it's very detailed now compared to the uh, previously progress reports. Yeah, now it says that um, uh, the uh, unless otherwise proposed by the contractor and agreed by the engineer in each progress report, the contractor shall include records of occupation and actual working hours of each class of contractors type and actual working hours of each contractor's equipment, temporary works used, plant installed, and quantities and types of material used for each work activity shown in the program at each work location and for each day of work. So you see the progress report is very detailed now. They ask for each activity of the program, for each location, for each day, you have to give all the labor material, labor histogram, material, details, equipment details, every. Yeah. So progress reports is very detailed now. Yeah. Key personnel, new 
sub clause have been introduced it was not in 99 however if you don't have a specified key person in the specification this clause will not apply but if you have uh, you know uh, identified the key person there then contractor shall appoint those people in the project okay so that's what it says now i'll come to the uh, defects and rejection okay mm. again uh, if there's a defect uh, engineer will instruct the contractor to rectify it so contractor will give a proposal so engineer has now 14 days to review that proposal and give his consent or a rejection if he fails to do so it's deemed no objection have been given another no objection situation yeah right let me come to the ownership of plant and ma ma materials yeah another change right it's a very important thing now when you come to the plant and material materials okay now uh, there was a confusion in 99 uh, ownership of plant and material now who owns the plant and material basically each item of plant and material shall uh, let me mute everyone yeah so each item of plant material shall to the extent consistent with the laws of the country become the property of the employer at whichever is the early of the following times okay when it is delivered to the site it becomes the employer's property okay that's clear when the contract is entitled to payment for the value of the plant and materials under sub clause 8.10 okay that is payment for plants and materials in the event of suspension okay that situation also plant will be uh, ownership will be transferred to the employer but what happen if you pay uh, through the payment certificates normal payment process if you pay for the material on site or the uh, plants what happened to the ownership so that was a loophole they have addressed it here when the contract is paid the amount determined for the plant and materials under sub clause 14.5 uh, payments then the ownership will be transferred to the employer again yeah so loophole has been rectified now commencement uh, commencement of the work previously uh, seven days notice should be given before the commencement date by the engineer for the contractor now it has been increased to 14 days so that is a difference yeah program uh, the previous clause is still there intact but they have introduced that uh, this program shall be prepared using a programming software stated in the specification if not stated the programming software acceptable to the engineer so they have uh, asked for a software reasonable for the engineer yeah right advance warning another new provision it was not in 99 each party shall advise the other other and the engineer and the engineer shall advise the parties in advance of any known or probable future events or circumstances which may adversely affect the works of the contractor's personnel adverse affect the performance of the works increase the contract price or delay in the execution of the works so both parties should give their uh, advance warning yeah so which is like a collaborative approach again yeah? extension of time now extension of time the clause is similar clause is same but they have introduced a new sub a new provision which is this the contractor shall be entitled to subject to sub clause 20.2 uh, greater than the estimate quantity okay if there's one item that uh, in the boq and the quantity has increased more than 10 percent and because of this increment there's a delay happen you can get an extension of time as per this new provision okay but when you give that when you assess that uh, eot engineer should think about other situations where the quantity has decreased and contractor had the opportunity to reduce the time so you have to think holistically and then give this eot that's what it says okay right concurrency very important this is the place that it's mentioned about concurrent delays if a delay caused by a matter which is the employee's responsibility is concurrent with a delay caused by a matter which is the contractor's responsibility contract and employee's delay happen together so there's a concurrency now the contractor's entitlement to eot shall be assessed in accordance with the rules and procedures stated in the special provisions 
so that means in the particular conditions of contract you have to mention that how to deal with concurrency concurrent delay either you will give the time or you will give time plus cost or cost plus profit you have to mention in the particular conditions so that's very important yeah uh, if you fail to do so then again the dispute will be still there so you have to address that okay uh, so we discussed that and acceleration another new provision okay now if the rate of progress is slow engineer can instruct to instruct uh, to get a mitigated program as well as increase the uh, you know um, uh, progress now there's thing called mitigation and acceleration now mitigation means there's a contractor delay so engineer instruct him to work faster so when he work faster he might have to work uh, overtime he might have to bring more resources that is called mitigation because it's contractor's delay and he's try to mitigate his delay so those mitigations contractor has to bear the cost but if there's a delay from the employer and contractor has the entitlement to get an eot but the engineer instruct to expedite the works you know work overtime bring additional resources that is called acceleration instructed acceleration in that situation uh, it can be considered as a variation by instruction and uh, contractor can get uh, additional cost for that acceleration so this is the only place they they mention about acceleration measures which was not in fitting 99 or any other form of conditions basically so acceleration has been mentioned in 2017 another new thing yeah right with that i'll go to the take in over what are the differences in the taking over so i'm going through the basic uh, or the significant changes yeah uh including the passing test okay so uh, you remember that we discussed about the um, uh, requirements to be taken over a uh, project to be taken over so the main uh, requirements are the works should be completed test run completion should be passed uh, and the uh, uh as bill records should have been approved and uh operations and maintenance schedules have been given approved uh training has been given and then um then you can issue a taking over certificate yeah so these are the requirements yeah so additional requirements have been introduced than to fit 99 basically yeah uh however now engineer shall within uh, what what will happen he, here is that if contractor feels that he can finish the project uh he can give a notice of taking over 14 days prior to the date that he intend to hand over the project or the complete the project so 14 days prior he can give the notice now from that notice engineer has 28 days to either issue to to either issue the uh, taking over certificate or reject that application and when he reject the application now he has to give a notice to the contractor with reasons he has to give the reasons now why he cannot issue the taking over certificates you see again it's collaborative yeah it's not uh, aggressive or it's not um, it's try to you know uh, clarify things uh, to the other party okay right i'll go to the right of access now right of access uh in the fidic 99 it was not very clear okay uh i'll come to that close very quickly right of access in 99 until the performance certificate has been issued the contractor shall ha have such right of access to the works as is reasonably required in order to comply until the performance certificate he says that until the day 28 days after the issuance of the performance certificate he can come to the site okay so that's a difference Uh, performance certificate now performance certificate uh, it's one of the documents that usually can engineers are not issuing on time yeah we have seen that in the industry so uh, the engineer shall issue the performance certificate to the contractor within 28 days after the latest expiry of the defects notification period okay that is clear as soon as the latest expiry of the defects notification period has been uh, elapsed he has uh 28 days to issue the performance certificate however if the engineer fails to issue the performance certificate within the period of 28 days 
The performance certificate shall be deemed to have been issued on the date 28 days after the date on which it should have been issued. OK, uh, as required by this sub clause. So if engineer fails to do so, it will be automatically deemed to be issued. OK, so another thing. Mm, right. Uh, unfulfilled obligations. Now, in relation to plant, this is a new provision. The contractor shall not be liable for any defects or damage occurring more than two years after the expiry of the defects notification period. OK, so this is a new provision given. Right. With that, we'll come to the uh, measurement and valuation. Previously, it was measurement and evaluation clause. That is basically the, our quantification or measurement clause. Now, previously, engineer has to measure things. Contract has to support. But again, there were no time limits given. Now here, it clearly says that engineer will measure and if he requires any support from the contractor, he shall give uh, not less than seven days in advance notice to the contractor and ask his help to do the measurement. Yeah. So again, a time limit has been given. OK. Uh, right now, uh, contractor should attend to these, um, you know, measurements and if he fails to do so, within 14 days after attending the measurement he has not uh, you know given any objection it deems he has considered that as accurate measurement okay so another time uh, limit and the deem provision is there uh, however if parties disagrees for a uh, determination or a uh, or a determination then Engineer shall assess provisional measurement for the purpose of interim payment certificates. It's another new provision. It's clear now. Engineer can certify even quantities, not only rates, he can certify quantities as well. Yeah. Uh, right. With that, let me come to uh, what are the significant changes? Right. Uh, percentage for profit. It was mentioned in the cost also defini definition. Here also it's mentioned that if you don't have percentage for uh, profit, it should be considered as 5%. Okay. Uh, now, if for any item work of work, the engineer and the contractor are unable to agree the appropriate rate or price, then the contractor shall give a notice to the engineer setting out the reasons why the contractor disagrees. After receiving the contractor's notice under this subclause, unless at that time such rate price is already subject to the last paragraph, engineer can uh, either agree or determine uh, within the time limits. So he has 42 days from this notice now. Uh, until such time, that, that was common in 99, until such time the appropriate rate has been agreed, engineer will uh, set one rate and uh, go ahead with the payments. Yeah. Omissions. So omissions, slight change is there. I will not go in detail on that because it's not uh, very important. Uh, variations. Okay. Variation and adjustment. Other than still, uh, a variation shall not comprise the omission of any work which is to be carried out by the employer by others unless otherwise agreed by the parties. So now employer cannot uh, um, omit and uh, give it to someone else or do by himself. Yeah, he it says that you cannot do that. Yeah, right. Uh, the contractor now in 99 also if an instruction being given for a variation, contract is bound to do so. The only situation that contractor can, uh, can say that I will not do the variation is uh, here. The contract shall execute and be bound by each variation. Unless the contractor promptly gives notice to the engineer stating with supporting particulars that the contractor cannot readily obtain the goods required for the variation. That is the only place that contractor says I cannot do that. Okay, so this this was a uh, very big problem in 99 because now say for instance if you instruct um, something that cannot be done by that contractor still he has to do the work because you know it is not covered here okay if, if he can prove that he cannot get the goods only he he can object otherwise he had to do the variation but here uh, 2017 has stipulated three instances that contractor can object for a variation. What are they? The varied works was unforeseeable 
have in regard to the scope and nature of the works described in the specification. OK, so if contractor feels that it is unforeseeable, it is not requires, it is not appropriate for the works, then he can object. For example, you are building a um, uh, school. And suddenly employee says that, OK, I need a swimming pool OK, or something else. Uh, then contractor can say that it was not foreseeable. Yeah, so I'll not do that. But when uh, when the same school is done, now there's no air conditioning system or heating system. Now employees instructing that or engineers instructing that. Now contractor has to do that because it is foreseeable. You know, any contractor or any person knows that you need an air conditioning system or heating system to a school. But uh, swimming pool is not necessary for a school. Yeah. So now they have brought, 2017 has brought this necessary and appropriate requirement to the variations. Yeah. So engineer cannot instruct each and every thing that he wants as a variation. Yeah. So because contractor can object now. The contractor cannot readily obtain the goods. That is the second thing that was in 99 as well. It will adversely affect the contractor's ability to comply with health and safety and protection of the environment. He can object. In these three instances, he can object. OK, so that's what <coughs> uh, that's what is clearly mentioned here. OK, uh, it is uh, stipulating more than what what was in 99. OK, right. Other provisions are same. Uh, now variations by instruction. Uh, if there's an omission, what will happen is uh, contract now in 99 also in um, sorry in uh, in 99 also there were two ways of doing variations basically engineer can instruct as a variation or engineer can ask for a proposal okay um, that we had to go through the uh, clause and infer basically but in uh, fidic 2017 it has been categorized clearly variation by instruction variation by uh, asking for a proposal it's clearly identified separately we will come to that now now variation by instruction. If there's an omission instructed by the engineer, then contractor can give his proposal and he can include loss of profit. It's clearly mentioned, okay, here. So that is a new, um, you know, clar clarification than 99. So variation by instruction is one way of doing variations, or variation by request for proposal is the second step. Now they have divided that uh, FIDIC 99 clause into two and categorized them se separately clearly, okay. Uh, right. Uh, now, variation by request for proposal. Now, what the engineer will do is he will ask for a proposal from the engineer for a variation. Now, contractor gives that proposal. And if engineer does not give any uh, consent or approval, what will happen? Now, contractor might uh, incur some cost preparing for that submission. That cost he can get from the engineer or the, from the employer EOT and payment of such cost. So this is a new provision which was not in 99. So here now again engineer should be very vigilant and he should uh, give his consent or he should object. Otherwise he have to pay uh, the you know uh, abortive cost of preparation of the variation proposal. OK, so that is a new provision. OK. Uh, now the important thing variation by instruction. Now the date the engineer receives the contractor submission shall be the date commencement of the time limit for agreement. OK, the contract shall be entitled to such EOT without any requirement to comply with sub clause 20.2 for variations. Uh, none of the, so for the variations. Contractor can get extension of time and for that extension of time, you don't have to give uh, notices that close sub clause uh, 20 will not apply. OK, so for variations without notices, you can get extension of time and related costs as well. So that's a new um, way of doing things, new change. OK, right. When uh, in the variations, I don't think any other things is very important. Uh, which we discussed just now. Ah, very important thing, another thing for the provisional sums. Now, when you assess the provisional sums, usually you will ask for quotations. You will, you know, there would be things. Now, if the engineer instructs the contractor under subparagraph A and B above, this in, uh, instruction may include a requirement for the contractor to submit quotations sometimes for a provisional sum. 
from the contractor suppliers. So uh, day after the engineer may respond. Uh, now contractor will give that quotations. So engineer now give his approval or rejection or accept one quotation from the contractor selected one. If the engineer does not respond within seven days of receiving the quotations, the contractor shall be entitled to accept any of these quotations at the contractor's discretion. So now for the provisional sum, engineer has now instructed uh, to go ahead with the provisional sum. Now contractor has given some quotations, uh, maybe three or more than three, and engineer is silent for seven days. Then contractor can choose any or not one of them and he can go ahead. Okay. So you see the engineer is now uh, should be vigilant. Yeah, he has only seven days. Same thing for the day works. If there is a requirement for quotations and contract has given the quotations, engineer has seven days to either approve it or reject it. If not, contract can select one of the quotations and he can work, do the work. So you see the PD 2017 is like automated doors. You know, the contract administration is almost automated. Right. Mm. Right. Uh, adjustment for changes in laws. Now in 99, Basically, if there is any adjustment for changes in legislation uh, of the country, contractor can get that additional cost. But what happened if that legislation saves money? It was not clear. Now it says that employer, if there are any savings because of the changes in the laws, employer can again go to the sub clause 20.2 employer's claims and get that deduction. OK, so you see it's balanced now both parties. Uh, uh, for the adjustment of cost, if you remember here, there was a uh, uh, formula given uh, uh, to do the works, but here the formula has been removed and um, index has not also been uh, identified basically in 2017. I don't think in uh, 99 also it was identified. Right, when we come to the payment, clause 14, uh, advance payment guarantee, a new uh, important provision. Now, advance payment guarantee, if you go to 99, say for instance, advance payment guarantee is uh, going to be, um, you know, um, expired. So, in that situation, what will happen is, where is it mentioned? Right, here it's mentioned advance payment guarantee. If the terms of the advance payment guarantee specify its expiry date and the advance payment has not been repaid by the date 28 days prior to the expiry date, the contractor shall extend the validity of this guarantee. Okay, he yeah, should do that. Uh, um, uh, the contractor shall immediately submit evidence of this extension to the employer with a copy to the engineer. And if the employer does not receive this evidence of you know extending the advance payment guarantee, then the employee shall be entitled to claim under the guarantee the amount of advance payment which has, he has not been paid, repaid. Okay, so now contract has to be vigilant. If the advance payment guarantee is going to expire, he has to uh, prove, he has to give evidence of ex extending the uh, advance payment guarantee. That's what it says. Uh, advance payment certificate. Now, advance payment certificate, engineer should, shall issue that within 14 days. Uh, for the advance payment certificate. Okay, so that's what it says. Right. With that, I'll come to the uh, application of interim payment. There's another change. If previously application of interim payment uh, had, uh, I'll show you that. One minute, give me a second. Issue of interim payment certificates. Uh, here, this one. So this was this. These were the headings of I, I interim payment certificates, estimated contract value, any amounts uh, um, added and deducted for the changes in legislation. Uh, then you from that amount you deduct the retention. From that uh, you deduct the advance payment recovery. Then uh, uh, if you are paying material on site, you add that, uh, and then any other deductions you need to do. Uh, you have to do uh, for the claims or anything uh, else and then you deduct all the previously certified amounts. Then you will get the net payment for that particular month. Now here you have the same um, hierarchy, but they added 
provisional sums. So they added three things. One is provisional sums. You have to add uh, release of retention money. You can add uh, and then contractors use of utilities. If you want to deduct any amount, you can deduct that also. So instead of this, any other add additions or deductions, they have introduced these three things. So that is a slight change. Yeah. Uh, another important thing is for the material on site. Now, previously, material on site, uh, there was no percentage given in the general conditions. Usually in the appendix to tender, you put a percentage. But now it says that the sum to be certified by the engineer in an IPC shall be equivalent to 80% of this agreed or determined amount. So when you certify material on site, you get the material on site amount and uh, Uh, you minimize, sorry, you get material on site and you pay 80% of the engineer's agreed or determined amount. It's not invoice value, it is engineer's determined value for that particular plant or material. Yeah, so it's, it is a change, slight change. Uh, uh, issue of IPC. Detail support for particulars. Right. The issuance of IPC, payment certificates. Previously, uh, no amount will be certified if the performance security has not been given. Uh, basically, that was the only uh, prerequisite uh, before. Now, they have given prerequisites for a payment certificate. What are the prerequisites? Performance security should be given. Of course, the contractor has not, uh, contractor has to appoint the contractor's representative. If not, he cannot get any payment. Okay, so that is another prerequisite now. Okay. Uh, and okay now the ipc when the engineer is issuing a payment certificate he needs to state the amount that engineer thinks that fairly uh, considers to be due for the employee contractor any additions or reductions and he has to give a detailed support in particulars uh, for the difference between certified amount and the corresponding amount in the application with the statement give the reasons for such difference, why he deduct money or why he add. He has to give reasons to the contractor. Okay, uh, That's what is mentioned. Okay. Mm. Uh, yeah, so others, I don't think it's very important. Uh, correction or modification. It's clearly mentioned that engineer can correct any mod, uh, anything or modification to the payments previous payment certificates it's clearly mentioned uh, so with that i'll come to the uh, payments uh, yeah it, it is also not that different termination by the contractor i'll come to that now uh, the contractor does not receive a notice of the commencement uh, so if the notice of commencement has not been received as per within eight, uh, 84 days from the letter of acceptance now contract can terminate under the employee's default. That is a new provision compared to 99. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So that is mainly that. So I'll come to the insurance clause now. Few important things. Now, insurance for the works have been uh, defined as FIDIC 99. It's the same thing. But in FIDIC 99, the amount was not mentioned clearly. It mentioned here FIDIC 99, uh, insurance for works. Uh, but it doesn't mention what is the value of the insurance for works. Now it's mentioned here, you have to cover the entire loss uh, in the insurance for works. So that means um, uh, the total contract sum, accepted contract amount should be covered. An additional amount of 15% of such replacement value to cover any additional cost incidental to the rectification of loss or damage, including professional fees and the cost of demolition and removal of debris should be added. If you remember, it was there in FIDIC 87. Now they have brought back. OK, so accepted contract pl amount plus 15 percent. You should add in the insurance for works. OK, so it's very clear now. OK. Uh, yeah. So um, uh, it says the contractor should um, insure the goods as well. So that's not a big deal. It's not uh, very different. So that is the main thing I identified in the, for the insurances, the difference. Now, claim provision. You won't believe when you come to the claim, 
claim uh, clause itself is around six pages. So it's very detailed. OK, so I'll not go through in detail of everything, but I'll try to give you in a sense what it includes. So a claim can be employer. Um, uh, employer can submit a claim or contractor can submit a claim. OK, so um, then uh, uh, then it should be detailed uh, submission should be there. Notices should be given. So the contractors and the employees claims are now identical. OK, they have to give the notices and as well as um, submissions. OK, if the claiming party fails to give a notice of claim within the period of 28 days, the claiming party shall not be entitled to any additional payment. The contract price shall not be reduced or increased. The time for completion or the DNP shall not be extended and the other party shall be discharged from any liability in connection with the event or circumstances given rise into the claim. So notice claim again condition preceded very clearly mentioned. If you don't give notice, you will lose your right. That's what FIDIC 19, FIDIC 2017 says. Now engineer has to give an initial response. This is a new provision for that uh, notice. What he can do if the engineer considers that the claiming party has failed to give the notice within 28 days, the engineer shall within 14 days after receiving the notice of claim give notice to the claiming party according accordingly with response. He would he would say that within 14 days that you have uh, not uh, given the notice within 28 days. If the engineer does not give such notice within this period of 14 days, the notice of claim shall be deemed to be a valid notice. Okay, so now engineer again he should be vigilant. Okay, uh, so that is that. But if either party can prove why uh, they cannot do that within 28 days with reasonable evidences, reasonable uh, with reasons which are reasonable, then the parties can or the engineer can assess that. Okay, so that uh, provision has been given even if, if it is condition preceded. Now condition um, uh, contemporary records have been identified uh, in detail. OK, um, so 20.1 contractors claims. Instead of this, now it's very detailed. What are the contemporary records? It's clearly mentioned that. OK, uh, the contractor shall permit the engineer to inspect all these records during normal working hours. So any contemporary records engineer, if engineer asked to uh, you know, check contract should give the access. OK, then a fully detailed claim should be given. What it includes a detailed description of the event or circumstances given rise into the claim, a statement of the contractual and or other legal basis of the claim. So legal basis, detailed description, all contemporary records and detailed supporting particulars. That means for the delay events, you now play the uh, time or cost implication using the contemporary records. So that should be given. So it's very clearly mentioned there. OK. Uh, yes. Well, parties uh, fails to submit the statement. The notice of claim shall be deemed to have lapsed. It shall have no longer be considered as a valid notice and the engineer shall within 14 days after this time limit has expired, give a notice of to the claiming party accordingly. That means OK, say for instance, contract is claiming now. He has given a notice within 28 days, but he fails to give the detailed claim within 84 days. Then he will lose his right. That's what it says. So there are now two condition precedent uh, situations. OK, notice as well as the detail particulars. Right with that, I think um, uh, it's not that much uh, here. It's mentioned. I'll come to uh, the avoidance of disputes. This is another new provision in the clause 21 DAB provision. Now, if the parties so agree, they may jointly request the DAB to provide assistance and no informally discuss and attempt to resolve any issue or disagreement that may have arisen between the between them during the performance of the contract. Now, say for instance, contract and employer, when they are doing the project, there's a dispute. Now they can ask from DAB uh, to support them informally discuss and support. Such joint requests may be made at any time except during the period that engineer is carrying out his duties. Now, if engineer is carrying out his decision and all, they cannot refer that matter to the DAP. But everything is finished. There's a dispute comes now. Then you can ask DAP to step in uh, informally. Such informal assistance may take place during any meeting, site visit or otherwise. However, unless the parties agree otherwise, 
both parties shall be present at each discussion the parties are not bound to act on any uh, advice gi given during such informal meetings and the dab shall not be bound in any future dispute resolution process or decision by any views or advice given okay so now dab can give his informal decision but they are not bound again if, if the parties come up with the notice of dissatisfaction and it, if it comes formally to the dab they are not bound by the previous decisions that they have given because it was informal uh, situation now this sub clause have been given to avoid the disputes yeah and to minimize the disputes as much as possible okay uh right with that i think uh, yeah the notice of dissatisfaction we discussed previously uh, from the notice of dissatisfaction of the dab uh, parties have 28 days to go for amicable settlement and then arbitration will start okay that's what the clauses clause says now i'll come to the particular conditions uh, uh contract data okay previously appendix to tender now it becomes contract data so you see contract data they have given the template to uh, prepare the contract data okay fully in language time for completion all this information yeah very important thing advisory notes on bim now if the project is using building information modeling fidic has identified what is bim is it's a you know common platform uh, informed you know informed fed model so they have said that okay you have you can go ahead with the fidic 2017 but they have said that when you do that make sure that these sub clauses have been amended appropriately so they have given that guidance also for the team and at the end they said that fidic intends to publish a technology guideline and a definition of, of scope guideline specific to beam with the aim of providing further detailed support in the future. But for the time being, if you want to use FIDIC 2017 for a BIM project, please make sure that these sub clauses have been amended appropriately. Okay, that's what they say. Now, FIDIC golden principles. Now, when you de develop particular conditions, FIDIC asks you to go through this, uh, make sure that you follow these golden principles. What are the golden principles? The duties, rights, obligations, roles, and responsibilities of all the contract participants must be generally as implied in the general conditions and appropriate to the requirement of the project. Please keep them. Yeah. Uh, the particular conditions must be drafted clearly and unambiguously. The particular conditions must not change the balance of risk, reward, allocation provided in the general conditions. All time periods specified in the contract for contract participants to perform their obligations must be of reasonable durations. GP4, yeah, fourth principle. You know, you cannot say that you know uh, the uh, contractor will be paid after 84 days. It's not reasonable. Yeah, so that's what it says. Don't change the roles. Don't change the uh, you know balance of risk. Try to be clear. Uh, don't change the uh, time periods. Uh, you know, uh, unreasonably. And uh, GP5 is all formal dispute should go through the DAB dispute adjudication and avoidance board. So they ask you to honor these five principles when you pr prepare the particular conditions. Okay. These FIDI golden principles are described and explained. They have published a new um, separate document for this, for the five principles and are necessary to ensure that modifications to the general conditions are limited to those necessary for the particular features of the site and the project and necessary to comply with the applicable law. Do not change the essential fair and balanced character of FIDI contract and the contract remains recognizable as a PD contract. So they want you to adopt these five principles so that the, re the contract would be balanced and it would be remain as FIDIC 2017 to a large extent. So that is new addition in uh, FIDIC 2017. Yeah, with that, uh, the others are almost same. So I think now we discussed most of the provisions that have been changed from 99 and we identified what are the key differences, the philosophy of FIDIC 2017. So let's again go through what are the major differences in brief. So the risk profile, they have kept as it is. Probably they have improved compared to 99. So it's risk balanced now. Closes, generally less flexible. You might, you might have seen, you know, it's very rigorous, very uh, descriptive. So since it is descriptive, it's become more complex. I would say that you know it might not be very interesting to you as well this CPD, 
but it's very difficult to read through the FIDIC 2017 and understand everything basically because so much of information yeah so because of that now it's become less user friendly that is a problem uh, there's new definitions step by step procedures uh, are there now it result a greater administrative burden on the contractor and the engineer and in principle it will be additional cost to the employers new time limits are get there which if not met trigger deem in provisions uh, symmetry between the contract and the employees rights and obligations are there we saw that in number of occasions uh, and then there's provision to promote collaboration between parties you know try to resolve the disputes uh, collaboratively and if you are rejecting something give reasons so collaboration has been um, you know promoted communications a broadening of the concept of communication through notices everything should be notices engineer's role an expanded role and powers for the engineer very prescriptive drafting of the role is there in size has been increased from 62 pages to 166 pages so this clear underpins that the new editions is much more detailed rigid than perspective terminology has been changed appendix to tender now contract data force majeure exceptional events dab dab new definitions and broader interpretation clause is there we we uh, saw that you know claims notices no objections notification dissatisfaction has been defined and shall may has been interpreted contractors profit uh, if it is mentioned cost plus profit unless otherwise agreed it will be 5% yeah advance warning system so parties now has an obligation to uh, you know be vigilant and issue advance warnings program um, more detailed requirements have been given software has been mentioned there are hundreds of deeming clauses and time bars okay which we saw variations variations uh, clauses are much more detailed and um, less uh, you know it's very comprehensive basically compared to 99 claims we discussed that um, you know the um, uh, condition precedent steps two steps are there one is notice the other one is detail particulars detail particulars previously uh, there were 42 days time limit from the notice in 99 now it has been increased to 84 days maybe you know because of the industry uh, situations probably you know 42 days might not be practical extension of time more grounds of entitlement of extension of time have been added most notably uh, notably delays caused by variations without the need to send notice of claim and delays caused by increase of more than 10 percent of quantities of BOQ item uh, also been added disputes claims evolve to disputes after a party sending a notice of dissatisfaction to the other party expressing their dis dissatisfaction a distinction between claim and dispute with the old clause 20 being split into two provisions now 20 is claims 21 is at disputes now enhanced claims and dispute provisions including the introduction of new standing dispute av avoidance and adjudication board is there and there's a focus on early dispute avoidance that's a new uh, approach which is very good so in general the new fidic red book appears to be materially amended the red book 99 materially amending and appears to be more rigid and requires proper contract administration from the onset of the project However, the changes made appear to have addressed the main issues of the FIDIC 99, which we have gone through few examples as well. Yeah. And the general principles. They have introduced these five golden principles when you prepare in the particular conditions. Duties, rights, obligations, roles, and responsibilities of the contract party must be generally uh, as implied as the general conditions. Don't try to change them. It should be clear and ambiguous, particular conditions, unambiguous. The particular conditions must not change the balance of the risk. All time periods should be reasonable if you go into change. And all formal disputes should go through the DAP, Dispute Evidence and Adjudication Board. So these, they ask you to honor these five principles when you prepare the particular conditions. Right, with that, I think uh, we came to the end of the presentation and uh, we discussed mainly the approach of FIDIC 2017 what are the key uh, differences uh, from FIDIC 99? We went through the details of the clauses as well. Uh, I hope I um, uh, we managed to give you an introduction to the FIDIC 2017.
and it's a large document basically so it's uh, the time is not permitting us to go one by one uh, but um, i would say uh, fidic 2017 is in general is ve is very comprehensive uh, large document uh, but the issue is when you try to implement this kind of a document in the industry it might take some time for the people to you know grasp it and uh, uh, you know start doing uh, implementing as it is yeah so that is fidic 2017 so do you have any questions i saw some uh, people have raised their hand uh, i think mahamud uh, has raised his hand in the first place mahamud do you have a question you can unmute yourself uh, if you have a question and then ask uh, then i'll go to mithila yes mithila um, you have raised your hand do you have a question uh, then shall we go to uh, sujit Yes, Sujit. Hello, can you hear yeah. me? Actually, hear my uh, uh, speaker is not working. Uh, sorry, right. my microphone is not working. Right. Uh, so I am a loud speaker now. Sure. Uh, uh, my question is related to this uh, EOT. Yeah. As, uh, as you mentioned, uh, if there is an increase in quantity, more than 10 percentage of the quantities in contract. Yes. So, I just want to uh, be more clear that if yeah. this quantity means, is it the BOQ quantity or the actual quantity as per the contract drawings? Right, it's a good good question. Uh, as per this, it's BOQ quantity. Uh, we'll come to that now, one minute. Uh, claims, it's a very good question. Uh, in the case of claim, uh, if the party, uh, no, EOT. So you have to go to the EOT version, 8.5. Uh, the contract shall be entitled to subject to 20.2 if the measured quantity of any item of work in accordance with clause 12 is greater than the estimated quantity in the bill of quantities. So oh. it, it's mentioned in the bill of quantities. And this 10% uh -huh. uh, increment should affect uh, to the project uh, and there should be a delay. So it should be affected to the critical part. Then you can get the EOT. So in that case, uh, the contractor has already, uh, they might have already considered the actual quantity, but they might, uh, they might not, uh, they might have not uh, in, uh, amended the BOQ quantity, but uh, the same has been considered in their uh, contract price while they. Uh, no, so it, uh, yeah, uh, usually PD 2017 for the lump sum contracts, it's correct, but this is uh, remeasurement. FIDIC 2017 uh, general form is for all remissionment contracts. So oh, contracts okay. usually don't change the quantities basically. For, for yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, for that right. it is correct. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay. I have one more doubt uh, yeah. related to this uh, variation uh, by <coughs> proposal request. Yeah. Um, saying that uh, yeah. uh, within seven days, the engineer, if I am the engineer, yeah. I have to uh, request for the proposal and within seven days, I need to agree or give the consent consent to the contractor. Otherwise, yeah. uh, they can use uh, their own materials or their own quotation and they can work on the variation. But uh, after my review, if I feel that this variation is not required, Okay. So, then again, uh, if the contractor is entitled for the cost incurred due to for preparing this proposal. No, it says that uh, therefore the contractor shall submit any further. If the contractor submit, the engineer shall as soon as possible respond by giving notice to the contractor uh, consent. The contractor shall not delay. Okay. Uh, before inspecting, submitting the proposal, giving reasons. The engineer does not give consent to the proposal with or without comments. And if the contractor uh, give not give to the proposal, with the, if the contractor has incurred cost, after the contractor shall submit for the particulars the engineer may reasonably require. Right, that is uh, that is not very clear. That is not very clear. In FIDIC 99, uh, it was implied that uh, uh, if if the variation proposal has you know 
cost in not you know the cost that you incur to prepare the proposal should be borne by the contractor but here now uh, it says that uh, if engineer doesn't give the consent uh, then uh, uh, contractor can get that yeah so contractor can get the extension of time and cost for the preparation of the proposal if he doesn't give the consent okay so that would be cost uh, i think the request came from the engineer okay so i think it's fair for the contractor to get paid whatever the additional cost incurred because the consent the requirement or the request came from the uh, engineer so i think it's fair yeah. Yeah. even though the variation uh, is not happening the, yeah uh, but uh, the still the contractor is entitled right yes yes because it it was asked by the engineer itself isn't it so i think it's fair for the contractor okay clear right thank you suji thank you thank you thank you uh disney patterson yeah, just a quick uh, couple of uh, questions manoj thanks for the presentation yeah. very informative um, yeah. in terms of amendments to uh, Uh, in terms of uh, the 2017 revisions do we yeah. have revisions to the other books as well like the silver book yeah uh, they have uh, revised uh, yellow book silver book and red book right yeah uh, and, and i think there are significant changes to yellow book i believe okay i'm not going through in detail but i yeah. I, i have read some articles on that basically yeah, yeah. understood because you know that might be significant because uh, the direction we are going nowadays is basically you know we are we are turning away from traditional lump sum contracts yes. and we are you know uh, moving towards more dnc uh, design and yes. build and other forms of contracts so yeah that might be significant and okay. the other question i had was uh, in terms of this new sort of fancy term that's been introduced compliance verification system mm. have uh, fitic provided any guidance with regard to what that document would look like no that that would be an issue actually uh, it it doesn't mention so it says that contract has to produce it and engineer can give the consent but there's no template or no uh, directions has been given it says that this system compliance uh, should uh, capture all the aspects of the contract and saying that the workmanship uh, let me go to that qm qm system quality management system compliance verification system the contractor shall prepare and implement a compliance verification system to demonstrate that the design materials uh, if there's any design uh, employ supplied materials plant work and workmanship comply in all respect with the contract so it's not uh, clearly mentioned but it has given uh, you know what other inclusion should be but no formats have been given yeah this this might be one of the things that goes out straight away from the contract yes. <laughs> absolutely yeah Okay. um just one more question in terms of the current you know the prevailing situation with covid yeah you know in a pandemic situation how how does fedix sort of cover that because you know in i am i am talking about it in the context of uh, you know contractors incurring additional costs because yes. on the one hand you could say that it's it's probably an exceptional circumstance yeah on the other hand if there are if there are say regulations mandated by the government like mask wearing or you know you need to have yes. two hoists instead of one on site and yes. you need to have you need to work on work in shifts or something like that you know how does how is that handled yes uh, in fidic 99 uh, it was mentioned that uh, you know if you need for the epidemic if there is an epidemic and if you need to have something for the epidemic then it should be covered by the contractor but if it is additional things that uh, uh, imposed by the uh, you know the government then it can be claimed as changes of legislation also that additional cost or you can go for force majeure as well uh, but it was not very clear but let's see if in fidic 2017 i was not looking in that angle uh, in the exceptional events it was not identified in 1999 uh, it was there i believe uh because i remember once i read the force majeure uh uh if it is uh, employees risk if it is in the employees risk no uh i'll go to the force majeure let's see because i remember the epidemics was mentioned 
and if you do need to do some work for the epidemic, uh, then it should be covered by the contractor. But that is just to, uh, you know, the minimum requirement. But if uh, government is imposing anything extra, then that should be covered by uh, changes in legislation also you can cover. I think force measure also you can cover because it was not anticipated by anyone uh, before the project has been, yeah. Where this is probably going is there might be another revision to FIDIC pretty yes. soon. Yes, yes, pretty soon, yeah. It, there might be something, but I need to investigate that further. It's a good question. Uh, I was uh, doing some, uh, you know, uh, reading on 99, I think. Re 99, I, I saw somewhere there it's, it was mentioned, but in nine, 2017, I was not uh, reading too much on that, basically. All right, thanks, Manoj. Yeah. No worries. Thank you, Disney. Uh, so I think uh, Mahmoud and Mithila, uh, do you have any questions? One of you, you have raised your hand. Right, if you don't have uh, the questions, then uh, we'll wind up. Uh, thank you very much for attending to uh, today's discussion. Uh, so uh, uh, thank you very much. And uh, uh, we have a RICA. Uh, APC guidance course starting on 28 May, uh, which is very detailed course, not only for RICS, but for in general for quantity surveying. It's a very good course. So if you want to join that, uh, please send us an email, uh, which is in the chat group. Uh, and thank you very much. So have a nice weekend. Uh, thank you.